Greetings, friends and fellow users of technology and producers of techno signatures. This is Ask an Astrobiologist, the show that celebrates the science and celebrates the scientists involved in our quest to understand the nature of life in the cosmos. I'm Graham Lau, also known as the Cosmobiologist, and we're brought to you by SeganNet.org and the NASA Astrobiology Program. And I'll tell you, folks, the grooviness abounds for this episode. We'll be talking about things like exoplanets and techno signatures and Mars settlement and so much more. But before I introduce this guest, we have to do some of our, our background things, like our monthly field site challenge. As you know, before every episode, the day before on Twitter at Saganorg, we release a photo of a field site relevant to astrobiology. And we ask you to tell us what is that image showing us? And if you like, you can tell us why it's relevant to astrobiology as well. Well, the winner for this month's field site challenge is Manavika Kana. Manavika wrote a really cool description of what she saw in that image. She said, is it the presence of mega structures using electricity as a way to power a self-luminous city? The location definitely seems to be Italy. Well, Manavika, yes, you're right on both accounts. The location is the Italian peninsula. And yes, these are structures built by humans where we are producing electricity to power our cities at night so we can read from our Kindles and watch Netflix. So we have lights over our streets and we can light our homes in the darkness of night. But astronauts flying overhead on the International Space Station, they can also see these lights. They can see these as signs of our technology down on the Earth below. From that lofty perch above, they see our techno signatures. And maybe aliens far away can see our techno signatures as well. And we're definitely looking for them ourselves. So thank you so much, Manavika, and all who gave us the right answer uh, on this image for the field site challenge for this month. And before we bring on our guests, uh, every episode, we do want to mention those people who are out there working really hard, our, our most staunch fans who are celebrating the show, who are sharing information about our upcoming episodes, about our guests, who are getting involved in the conversation, who are the ambassadors for Ask an Astrobiologist. This month, we want to highlight Azul Pinochet Barros, Delara Kilicharslan, Anarup Mahanti, and Kashish Gupta for helping us out and sharing the word about Ask an Astrobiologist and sharing our show uh, thank you to all of you, as always, uh, for being so involved in what we're doing here and trying to bring the voices of astrobiologists to the world. With all that said, now I get to introduce our guests. Uh, Jacob Hock Misra earned his undergraduate degrees in astrophysics and computer science at the U University of Minnesota. He also earned a master's degree in meteorology and his PhD in meteorology and astrobiology at Penn State University. He's also a research scientist at Blue Marble Space Institute of Science and a good friend of mine. So welcome to the show, Dr. Jacob Hockmistra. Thanks so much, Graham. I'm happy to be here. Yeah, it's really, I mean, we've talked for a long time now about getting you on the show. You've been doing so much these past many years now in so many different areas of astrobiology and, and beyond astrobiology as well. And just last week, you helped to run this workshop called Technoclimbs. Uh, so I definitely want to talk about all these cool things that you do. But first, let's get to know a bit about you. Uh, for instance, I kind of want to know what your science story is that brought you into becoming an astrobiologist. What, what took Jacob Hock Misra from a young boy to becoming who you are now as an astrobiologist? Absolutely. That's a great question. And, you know, I really don't even remember a time when I was not interested in space ever since I have memories. I've, I've, I wanted to be a space scientist before I knew the word astronomer. I even quickly pulled out. I still have my first book about space right here. I'm sure this is not in print anymore. It has all kinds of great numbers, like how long would it take to walk around the Earth and how many Earths fit inside the sun. And on the last page, it says, are there any space creatures? It says, no one knows yet. Maybe one day you will be a space explorer. So that's the nutshell of my story is here I am fulfilling uh, my first book's call. <laughs> but, um, you, you know, as I... I I, I was always, you know, interested in, in, in not just math and science, but really everything, you know, and I think that's part of what makes astrobiology so fun is, you know, being interested in English and history is really just as relevant as, as studying math and science and everything else. It, it's truly interdisciplinary. So, you know, I, I, I enjoyed school. I got involved in a lot of programs, um, science clubs and math clubs and music and things like that. 
Um, you know, the other side of that is, you know, I grew up um, uh, evangelical Christian. And so I've always been thinking about these big quest- questions of meaning and purpose and, and what's out there. And, and I'm, I'm an atheist now, so I don't actually look for God anymore. But I don't think it's coincidental that I'm interested in thinking about extraterrestrial intelligence. And a lot of the other scientists I meet uh, in, in the SETI and search for extraterrestrial intelligence uh, SETI and uh, techno signatures community, um, th- there is a presence of people who have similar backgrounds. And you, m- you might have started out more strongly in a religious tradition, but you don't lose that sense of these big philosophical questions of why are we here? Where are we going? What does it all mean? And, and so I, I really continued, you know, thinking through the science and those philosophical questions, uh, you know, through high school into college, you, you already read my degrees, um, you know, but, but um, astro, astrobiology really gave me this, this interesting skill set to, um, to, to pursue those big questions. So I guess the other thing I'll mention is, is I was really interested in becoming a cosmologist initially, um, the, part, partly with the, 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 the philosophical side of the Christian tradition, you know, I, I like thinking about evolution and Big Bang, and those are still part of astrobiology. But I, I was, I worked actually in a cosmology lab for a couple of years, one, one theoretical cosmology lab, and then one experimental cosmology lab. And that was really interesting. It's re- relativity and quantum mechanics. I'm sure it would have been a really fun career. But in my uh, junior year of college, uh, Jill Tarter came to our astrophysics department, and she gave a lecture where she talked about SETI, but I actually heard the word astrobiology for the first time. And um, I knew about SETI, this idea of listening for radio signals from other alien civilizations that might be out there. I wasn't really sure what to think of it, and I didn't really understand how it connected with the rest of science. And Jill gave this great talk about uh, astrobiology, and so I went home and I looked for summer programs in astrobiology. I found one at Penn State. I worked that summer with Jim Casting, who then became my graduate advisor. And, and you know, that, that's really how I ended up doing this specific kind of research, studying what makes a planet habitable, what kind of planets might support life, how would we search them for signs of life, and how would we search them for signs of, of technology. And uh, yeah, so, so here I am. Uh, I, I made it from, from little kids staring at the sky to, to space, space scientists science, like, like I wanted, wanted to be. Oh, I love it so much. I have to find a book like that for my son, Nolan, for when he's ready to start reading books that might 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 lead him into his own career and, and lead him into a dream for the future. Uh, Jill is so wonderful. We had her as a guest previously on the show. Uh, so it's cool to hear that she kind of – she gave you that impetus to kind of go even further from cosmology into astrobiology. And it's really great to hear you know, that you consider these larger questions too. Sometimes people think of astrobiology as just being about the science, but there really is this – in a l- larger realm of it and philosophy and how we really ask these larger questions about the nature of life in the cosmos. I'm so glad to hear that. Uh, and you brought up so much there at the end about your work in, in modeling exoplanets and trying to look for signs of life and look for techno signatures. Uh, so let's talk about that for a little bit. Uh, what kind of research are you currently doing uh, in, in, this, in this work of looking for signs of life, for instance, on exoplanets? So one of the projects that I'm working on now, it's, it's coming to a close. It's been a three-year project with several of my colleagues um, in, in astrobiology. And, and we're looking at the idea of, uh, so first there's this idea of habitable zones. What, what distance can a planet be from its star to support liquid water? That doesn't mean that's the only type of planet that could support life, but that's the way we can search. That's a, it's a search constraint that works for telescopes. So it, it's just a way to search. Um, and, and figure out which planets are more or less likely to have, have water and then maybe, maybe life. Um, so a lot of people work on study this problem. Um, specifically, this project is about binary stars and the habitability of planets in binary star systems. Um, binary stars are stars for which there are, are two of them. They orbit each other. Uh, when I was in college, in you know, not too long ago, 2001, I mean, I guess it's a long time for some of your viewers, perhaps. It doesn't feel that long for me. Um, but when I was in college, I learned uh, correctly that about half of stars are in binary systems. And we, we, we know that that's still true. Um, I was also told that they probably can't support planets because the planets would be dynamically unstable. Well, that's actually not correct because we, we found some planets. Some of my colleagues in this project have detected planets in binary star systems, 
Um, we don't have the technology to find the Earth-sized ones yet, but we found these big Jupiter and Neptune-sized ones, and they are at the habitable zone distance. So in principle, we can't rule these out. And so, you know, we, we use computer climate models like you might use for weather prediction or climate prediction on Earth, and we adapt them to be able to consider weirder atmospheres. Like what if CO2 was millions of times higher than today, which wouldn't even happen for climate change? Or what if there was lots of methane or hydrogen or all sorts of things? Um, but, but, you know, the nutshell, what we're finding is that there's really no reason that planets in these binary systems would not be habitable. They might have like weird weather systems, like different kinds of seasons because of having two stars. But, you know, contrary to what I was told just, you know, 15, 20 years ago, um, not only are, can they have planets, but it, it, if you have a planet, there's really no reason to think it would be any less habitable than Earth. Maybe even more, you know, maybe having extra seasons helps accelerate the development of life or technology. So you can kind of run run wild with your imagination on those. But like, you know, I'm sure there's Star Wars fans. These are the, like Tatooine is the classic example. And so so, you know, we cannot rule out. Tatooine habitability in the galaxy, in the, in the universe, that at least based on what we're finding, like we should search binary and single stars for, for, for habitable, habitable planets. Planet. I love that so much. And I love this idea of letting your imagination kind of run wild. Uh, Nick Schneider is a professor at the University of Colorado who I had for a graduate class in uh, astrophysics. And he was mentioning how with exoplanets, almost everything we ever think we know about planets keeps getting smashed over and over again by new discoveries with new kinds of exoplanets. And so maybe, yeah, maybe there's all kinds of weird things out there. Um, so quick, fun question. Say you're, you're a smart alien uh, civilization, 100 light years away from where we are right now, and you have the same astronomical technology that we do. What, what would you think looking at the Earth and Venus and Mars? What would you think looking at our solar system from that far away? Well, if I was an alien that far away, I guess it would depend on what level of technology we were at. Um, but, but we tend to think that any extraterrestrials that we could observe um, are probably going to be around for a really long time. They probably are not this transient phenomenon just because the likelihood that we catch a civilization in you know, its, its short, brief lifetime before it goes extinct it is just incredibly astronomically lucky. But the ones we're more likely to see are any that have lasted for not just thousands, but, you know, not even hundreds of thousands, probably millions of years or longer, because the time scales we talk about in astronomy are, are so big. A, a star like the sun has another, you know, it will last for five to 10 billion years. So, um, so yeah, if, if I was in one of those civilizations, a, a long lived civilization, and I looked at Earth, uh, I mean, we're, we're in. We're in a precarious phase. We've we've developed a lot of technology. We've developed the ability to send signals through interstellar space to start modifying our environment, to modify our surface. And, and I think even from remote observations, it would be unclear if Earth could manage its trajectory for the long term. Right. And, and you've been you've been really involved. You've written articles about uh, the future of our civilization and, and what comes next in our civilization. Um, do you think that, that technologically that we, that we are doomed or that we're destined to, to, to damage ourselves? Do you think there is a very good way forward? Um, how, how do you envision well, the future looking forward right now for our civilization? I, I'm an optimist. I'll never say we're doomed. That's, that's, there's, there's always, you always have to try. <laughs> um, but we have some big challenges. We definitely have big challenges. There's, I mean, I mean, climate change is almost a symptom of deeper problems. There's, there's uh, re really, it's energy use. There's, there's aspects of the world that are dealing with, uh, with high, high population growth. And then the areas that are not are, are dealing with an aging population and how to support the elderly. So those are big social problems. And coupled to those is a demand for increased energy. Everybody wants to have you know, I have a very nice lifestyle here in the United States. I'm very grateful for it. There are, and you know, there's lots of other places in the world that have similar lifestyles, but many places that do not at all have, have a nice air conditioned house to be in, in the summer, for example. And I, I think everybody has, I would love for everybody to have that, but the reality is probably more of us need to not have those luxuries in order to, to really have a, a sustainable future. And so that's a really tricky balance. And so there's, we're continually demanding, 
you know, exponentially more energy each year. Um, can we flatten out that curve to use the, uh, the metaphor of our times? Can we flatten the energy curve so that, uh, uh, you know, at some point in the future, we, we've slowed that growth and, and we found a way so that the energy we consume is, is matching the energy we produce and, and we're not outpacing our own growth. And that's really the, the risk. Well, that's great. Um, I mean, it's important to think about, right, that this is where we are going. Um, but it also kind of leads me into this idea of the Kardashev scale and how civilizations use energy. Uh, and for a lot of us, uh, that was kind of our introduction to the idea of techno signatures was this idea of the Kardashev scale. But it's a really big scale that kind of goes out to like galactic civilizational technology use. Uh, and you just organized this conference last week, this workshop last week called Techno Climbs, where uh, you were discussing the science of techno signatures and what's coming in looking for technological uh, signatures out there. Uh, I wonder if you could just for our audience speak about what techno signatures really are uh, and what this conference, this this workshop was doing in trying to better understand that science. Absolutely, and I'll even start with uh, the Kardashev scale since you mentioned it. So, so the idea with that Kardashev was a Russian scientist precursor to to a modern astrobiologist, and and. Um, the idea was what are the different scales of energy use are there for a civilization? So the type one would be using all the energy available to a planet from, from the sunlight, the starlight falling upon the planet. Um, and then a type two would be extending that sphere using all the sunlight available to, to the entire solar system, the planetary system. And then a type three extends to the entire galaxy using all the energy output of all the stars. Now, we did talk about some of that at, at this meeting, uh, which I'll get into. We, we talked about galactic scale techno signatures. And, and, but but um, I think an, an interesting point that actually even motivated this meeting, techno climbs being technological climates. Um, one of my colleagues, University of Rochester professor Adam Frank, he developed a, a scale that's kind of a complement to the Kardashev scale where it's what are the scales of step steps in planetary evolution, where there's like a class one planet, which would be like Mercury, no atmosphere, it's just heated by the star and, and, and it radiates out and that's it. Uh, you might have a type two, which would be like Mars. So there's no life, but there is a climate, there is weather. And so if, if you're observing with a telescope, you could differentiate between, between those two. And we found lots of examples of, you know, Mercury's and, and maybe some Mars type planets. Um, if if um, it, type three and type four then are planets with life, type three is a thin biosphere, maybe like the early Earth, where you would see some signs of life, but but it might be a more difficult signature to pull out, uh, and and the influence of life is is not penetrated deep into the planet's geology yet. Uh, type four, you have a thick biosphere, so everywhere you look on the planet, life is present, and that would be. Um, that would be a very uh, noticeable biosignature if uh, if you were to observe that planet. So then the one step further is a type five, where you have a thick biosphere and a thick technosphere. So what does that mean? Well, it means that there's technology on the planet and it is like the biosphere in the sense that the life is permeating the whole planet. You have technology that, that has influence at all scales of the planet to the extent that it could be remotely detected if you're looking for that type of signature. And so that's a techno signature. It's some type of technological evidence on a planet or, or elsewhere orbiting the planet or in the solar system, but something that betrays evidence of technology, just like a biosignature would be something you would look for that would betray evidence of life. And so Earth, we're Probably not a type one. We're definitely not a type one Kardashev yet. We were, I think, about point seventy percent or eighty percent there, roughly, depending on how you calculate it. And we're not at a type five, a class five planet yet. We don't have this full thick technosphere. We're, we're what Adam Frank calls a hybrid planet. We're between class four and five. And the question is, can we make it for the long term to be this this long term sustainable planet with a thick Technosphere. Hmm, interesting. Does he also in, in this writing? Does he, does he envision that technosphere growing out from the planet as well? Um, I mean, we have things in orbit right now around our world. Uh, a lot of us have loved like games like Halo and and Ring World from uh, Larry Niven and science fiction. Some of these ideas. Um, what what is that for a techno signature then in this kind of scale when it goes beyond the world? Absolutely. 
Absolutely. Yeah, that, that's where it's a complement to the Kardashev scale. So the, the Adam scale really takes you up to class in you know, type type one Kardashev. And then, yeah, of course. So, you know, at, at this meeting, TechnoClimbs, which was uh, an online workshop, we, we did pitch it to NASA as an in-person workshop. And then the pandemic happened and we said, like, well, this is a great opportunity to at least still get together and talk about Technic signatures. And it was a really fun time. And I'll tell you about the workshop in a bit. Um, but we focused it really heavily on discussion, which again can be more fun when you get to have dinner with people. But you know what? We had like, you know, over two hours of, of really fun discussion every day, uh, really thought provoking. Uh, we had a really wide uh, range of career stages. We had everyone from a high school student to, to uh, you know, retirees in the field. Jill Tarter was even there. Um, we had, we, we, it was, and we even have uh, three papers that are coming out of this that are being worked on now as to, to report to the community and what we did. Um, so we certainly talked about techno signatures at all scales. So some, one example of a techno signature might be things in the planet's atmosphere. So with bio signatures, you might look for wet methane and water vapor and oxygen and ozone. So techno signatures might be something like chlorofluorocarbons. Uh, which, which, as far as we know, there's no biological process to make them. These are industrial gases. So there's, you know, things like that. And then there's a whole class of these, these CFCs and related compounds um, that if, if you were to see those in a planet's atmosphere, that might be either sign of industrial pollution. Maybe they're, they're also potent greenhouse gases. So maybe they're, you, you know, a civilization is using this to terraform a planet. You could put a bunch of chlorofluorocarbons in Mars, for example, to help warm that up if, if, if that were something we were trying to do. Um, but, but there's other examples. It could be uh, geoengineering. Maybe you know, there's this proposal that I, I don't really think we should do, but it's this idea of putting uh, essentially dust, like aerosol particles up in the upper stratosphere layer of the Earth's atmosphere to reflect away sunlight to offset climate change. I mean, some people are researching this. And so if you were to do this, you know, over long time scales, you might be able to detect evidence of that as a techno signature. Uh, so there's there's things in the atmosphere itself that could be detected, but then move a little ways out. We have lots of satellites orbiting Earth. Um, our satellites may only be dimly detectable. It depends on, on what kind of instrument our hypothetical alien observers are using, but you could imagine a much thicker satellite belt uh, in orbit either around the planet or even at a greater orbit, uh, that, that you know, a further distant out orbit, um, and that could certainly be detectable. Uh, we talked about, you know, this Kardashev type one and type two. Well, how do you harness all the energy coming from your sun? Well, you, you build what's called a, a Dyson sphere or a Dyson swarm named after physicist Freeman Dyson. He proposed the idea. And so this is building giant solar collectors that orbit, you know, essentially enclose the whole star, if possible, at, a, at some orbit. And, and you're collecting vast amounts of energy to support, support your um, uh, your, your civilization. So those are, are some types of techno signatures we might imagine. Um, now, an, another thing we could think about too is the idea, if, if, if I was an you know, alien in one of these long lived civilizations out uh, hundred light years away, especially you picked a very short distance, hundred light years away, which is good for this experiment. So uh, I might want to send an exploratory probe to the, the Earth, to, to the solar system, and see what's going on there. Um, we've sent spacecraft out of the solar system, not necessarily to any other stars yet, but the Voyager and Pioneer spacecraft um, have left or are leaving the solar system. And so we know this is the thing you can do. Breakthrough Starshot is a privately funded mission that's at least developing the concept for how you would send little postage stamp-sized probes to Alpha Centauri, Proxima Centauri system. Um, so this is a thing we could do. And so that's a thing you could search for in the solar system is, well, is there evidence of extraterrestrial spacecraft in the solar system? They might not even work anymore. It could be the end of life of their mission, but there's these stable 
Lagrange points, they're called. There's stable gravitational positions between planets. It's kind of a weird thing to think about. But there's certain places in space where you just get asteroids and junk collecting and it just sits there because it, even though it's just outside of the planet, that's a, a stable orbit for it. So there could be alien garbage floating around in some of these places and we just need to find the right way to look for it. I don't know how likely these hypotheses are, but these are things we can think about doing now. And, and that's one way to think about techno signatures. We're not saying we as humans can imagine every possible technology out there. What we're actually saying is we, can, we know what we can do and we know what we could do with a lot of funding or just a bunch more time. And those are at least things that are plausible. They are consistent with the laws of physics that we know. There might be other things out there. I would love to know about them, but that's at least a great way to start thinking about this is what's plausible, what's physically possible. It's harder to rule things out, but you can at least make plausibility arguments and try to search for those things. And I guess one other thing I'll say from this meeting, it's directly related to that, is you can't always have a neat hypothesis-driven investigation like that for technosignature science. A lot of astronomy was was serendipity. It was a, a, an unprecedented discovery of something weird, and you did not necessarily have theory for that observation at the time, and that had to come second. And so we should do both. We should look for plausible things that we can think of for technosignatures. We should also look for weird things everywhere not jump to the conclusion that it must be aliens, but look for weird things. You're going to learn interesting science anyway. And, you know, the discovery of, ex of a techno signature, it could come from some field that's not doing astrobiology right now. And they find something weird and hopefully eventually talk to some astrobiologists who help sort it out and probably spend decades arguing about it. But, you know, may maybe that's what, what it'll really be is not this nice, neat, we discovered chlorofluorocarbons on, you know, another planet, but it'll be just something totally weird that we didn't expect. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. I mean, you know, you have those eureka moments, right? Um, and sometimes it's like, well, why didn't I think of that? Because there are things that we just don't know yet. Uh, we humans are learning. We're always curious. We're always learning. So I'm very glad to hear you frame it that way. Uh, also glad to hear that you brought up Freeman Dyson and the idea of the Dyson sphere, since it was originally his idea just for why we should be looking for alien technology outside of just radio waves, right? We should look in infrared as well to find something like a Dyson sphere. <laughs> I see your awesome. Yeah, I have this uh, nice model of a Dyson sphere. Ryan Felton made this. He was on our organizing committee. So we have life looks for life. It's a say, uh, Carl Sagan quote. And yet spins around so we've got a little 3d printed dyson sphere here it's very cool yeah we can go into philosophy forever of whether or not it's like you know that life actually does have to look for life is that part of something that's innate and born into us uh we don't have much more time yet uh, between uh, just, just you and i uh conversing here i see lots of questions coming in from our audience uh a reminder for those watching if you haven't asked a question or would like to ask a question for, uh, for dr hawk misra uh you can ask in the chat on facebook or on SeganNet. Uh, or if you like, you can use hashtag AskAstroBio on Twitter to ask a question. Uh, those are starting to, to peel in now in my teleprompter. Uh, before we go to the, to the Q&A, though, uh, I have a few more things I'd love to talk about with you. Uh, one of those, I know that right now you're working on a book on Mars settlement, specifically focusing on the governance of Mars. Uh, and I'm wondering if you could, you could talk to us about why that issue is so important to you uh, and what you envision for the, the, for the future of human exploration of Mars, especially Mars governance. Well, I think a lot of us are interested in this idea of where are humans going to go in space. And you know, that's not what that, that's separate from this idea of planetary habitability, but but it is related in the sense to what extent does a species leave its planet and is that possible? Because that would inform what kind of techno signatures we would look for. Um, but um, you know, as these private investors, uh, well, you know, there's, there's companies like SpaceX. Um, and, and others that are interested in either going to Mars or asteroids and uh, NASA and China and, and um, the United Arab Emirates. United Arab Emirates actually has a, a mission uh, that they're planning on sending humans to Mars by 2117. So there's this interest in sending people to Mars. And I started wondering, well, how does you know, governance work? Who owns Mars was my first question. And I started you know, getting deeper into it and learning that, well, there's this outer space treaty that says that you can't have space 
appropriated by a sovereign nation. So it can't be claimed by anybody. But, you know, it's it's not just as cut as dry as that because you're still there's there's momentum in building um, you know, essentially space settlements. Um, as I learned more about it, this Outer Space Treaty was written during the middle of the Cold War uh, when, when the, the real interest in space was was who's going to gain dominance of space, the United States or the Soviet Union. And they were afraid of the militarization of space. They were afraid of the moon becoming either the 51st state or another um, you know, an, an annex of Russia. Um, so, so that was part of the motivation. There was nobody was thinking about commercial space exploration when this was written, and so that's really what motivated me to 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 work on to, on studying this. And um, so, it's kind of the nutshell of the book is what can we learn from governance on Earth, where where we have you know sharing of resources, where we're where it's not just one nation owns everything, but are there places we can look? where there's this sharing either successfully or unsuccessfully, and what can we learn from that for what might uh, apply to the Mars environment? Um, so one example is, is Antarctica, where uh, it's Mars-like in the sense that it's very remote. You have to have all your supplies uh, delivered on a regular basis. The, the conditions for survival are, are not uh, really they don't really promote human flourishing. You really have to have, have be prepared in order to survive in Antarctica. Um, and also most of what goes, goes on in Antarctica is science research. And that may be at least, you know, for, for the near term future, a lot of what happens in space too, and is happening in space. Um, so the Antarctic treaty system kind of is a weird model. We won't get into all the details, but there actually are claims in Antarctica and the treaty came later some of those claims conflict with each other, but the treaty, it suspends those claims. So that's kind of the world we're living in now is where there are claims in the Antarctic. Uh, you, if you go to, for example, the Argentine sector, I believe they will stamp your passport with an Argentinian stamp. But it's meaningless in the sense that the treaty says that no one can assert that they control any part of Antarctica. Um, the prerequisites to be part of the treaty uh, it is to have the science base in Antarctica. So it's an interesting solution also where it's not a United Nations treaty, but anybody could collaborate with any nation to, to have scientists in, in Antarctica to be part of that organization. Um, the reality of that is it, it's included most nations other than uh, almost all of Africa, except for South Africa, who probably doesn't have resources to invest in an Antarctic research program. Um, so there's a lot there, obviously, that we won't unpack right now, but you can see where an example like that, there's some, some benefits and, and maybe some aspects to avoid with what we would do on Mars. I'm not saying my book will solve the problem. My goal is to, to start this discussion well in advance of when the first humans actually go to Mars. That's awesome. I definitely look forward to reading the book, too. Uh, the first thing that comes to mind for me is how governments through time have, for instance, taken over the lands of indigenous peoples uh, and then relegated them to other areas or not at all uh, and just wiped them out and then chose that they own this land now and, and how that those land laws have worked through time based on conquerors and things like that. So I look forward to reading the book for sure. Uh, I'd love to talk more about that, but uh, I really want to get into the Q&A soon. One more thing I want to bring up with you before I, I open it up to our audience here. Uh, you know, you're such a well-rounded scientist. You do all these really cool things and biosignatures and exoplanets and technosignatures and Mars governance and, and these things like this. Um, but you're also really into music and you play with a band. Uh, tell us about that. What, what drives you to be involved in, in, in joining this band and traveling around making music? I've played music for uh, most of my life. You know, I, I started briefly on trombone, but then moved to percussion and I, I play, you know, auxiliary percussion and drum set and, and mallet instruments. And so I play in, in the band is Mystery Train. And that's even how I met my wife, Gina. Uh, she's the keyboard player. And so I play, you know, uh, Percussion. I have a vibraphone. Uh, we have a, a drum set player. We have a you know ry rhythm guitar, lead guitar, and bass. Um, we're all original. We're you know stylistically along the lines of like Grateful Dead, Almond Brothers, Pink Floyd. But it's all original music. Our, our lead guitar Dan writes a lot of the songs. Gina writes an awful lot. I write a few songs. Um, and and yeah, you know we play a lot of festivals. We'll play indoor shows over the winter time. 
Um, you know, we've we've been around for 11 years now, and we've had some fun shows. We've we opened for the Dark Star Orchestra and Rusted Root and the Mickey Hart Band, and and yeah, seen seen a lot of fun places. Been around the Central Pennsylvania region, and you know, into some other states. Um, right now, of course, with the pandemic, we are not uh, uh, playing shows, but we did. You know, after 11 years, we've put out a lot of live recordings, but we've never really done a proper, you know, mixed studio recording. So that's what we're doing now. And so we will be available uh, to listen to on Spotify soon. Oh, that's wonderful. I look forward to listening to it then. Uh, I've seen some of the videos of you guys playing live, but yeah, a studio recording would be awesome. Uh, I'll definitely help with Ask an Astrobiologist to share that. Um, <laughs> well, let's go Let's go to the Q&A now since we do have a bunch of questions pouring in. I know we don't have time for all of them, but everyone at home, please, asking, please uh, keep asking your questions. If we don't get to them, we'll also share them with Jacob and he can answer them online potentially later. Um, let's start off with a question from Marianne Denton. Uh, a longtime viewer of the show. Uh, she's at Astro Limno, or Astro underscore Limno on Twitter. Marianne asks, is there an Earth orbiter slash satellite that shows our level of or, or rate of change in anthrop- anthropogenic CO2 that could help us model for atmospheres of exoplanets that may infer the presence of industrialization? Well, there are definitely satellites that measure CO2 from space. I think there's several of them. Um, I'm not going to be able to name them off the top of my head, but uh, that is how we we do, you know, as scientists, Earth planetary scale monitoring and, and how we determine not just what the CO2 concentration is on on the global scale, but but on a regional scale as well. Uh, so, yeah, there's there's a lot of people building their careers off of, of those kind of measurements and that kind of analysis. Um, the second part of your question, um, yeah, to some extent, what we're dealing with with climate change or, or how we respond to it, that does teach us a lot about, you know, how does an industrial civilization develop? So we're using, you know, much of climate change is, is fossil, related to fossil fuels. There's also uh, changes in land use, deforestation. But the, the part that's about uh, fossil fuels Fossil fuels are an ancient fuel source that come from ancient plants that took a long time to develop. So that's that's the issue is that we our use of them is much, much faster than the rate at which fossil fuels are replenished, which is incredibly slow over geologic time scales. So how we deal with that is at least a case study in how any other civilization deals with having this really rapid energy intense phase with a fuel that doesn't have an infinite supply. Um, so, so how our story unfolds will help us with the search. That's really cool. Yeah. That's a great quote too. I might have to steal that one for later. Uh, another question, and this goes back to Mars governance uh, from one of our ambassadors and actually a research associate with me, uh, Anarup Mahante wants to know uh, if humans ever colonize another planet, what do you think the ideal system of governance might be? That's a big question. Well, I'll pl- I will plug my book with that. I think the ideal system of governance would be to let Mars be sovereign so that once you set foot on Mars as a settler, you are now a planetary citizen of Mars. You don't get to have property on Earth. Earthlings don't get to control Mars. And the Martians get to decide what works best for them. That's, it's an ambitious project. It, it, it's ambitious because... You're so resource limited on Mars. So when would that happen? I don't know. But yeah, I don't. I, I actually don't have one particular governance model. But I think the Martians are going to be the best to determine that. No, that's, that's cool. Yeah, self sovereignty. <laughs> Let them do it themselves. <laughs> uh, another question from Sudita Biswas, uh, coming in from Saganet. Uh, Sudita wants to know how does one confirm an exoplanet might be more habitable than the Earth? Which is an interesting question. That is an interesting question. There are uh, some scientists that are trying to uh, quantify this. Uh, Abel Mendez at the University of Puerto Rico is really interested in habitability metrics. Um, but uh, so, so a simpler answer from my work with climate models is you could say something like how, what fraction of the time does this planet have liquid water on it? That's just one type of scenario. The bigger answer to your question is, is we're thinking about it. We actually just need to have more observations of exoplanets to really be able to, to compare what you know, that might be. You could also think about a planet that has 
less water available on certain areas of its surface than others. Um, but there's going to be a lot of factors. So not not just any one of those, but but many factors that would that would do do that. People even ask, is Earth as habitable as it could be? Uh, that's an interesting question. And maybe you know you could imagine where there was a little less ice and more jungle. But 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 um, th- those those are the fun questions that that you know you get to ask in astrobiology. Yeah, it's a cool question, and actually that really leads well into our next question from my co-host uh, and a good friend, Sanjoy Sam. Uh, Sanjoy asks, can you speak a little bit more to our own planet as a lab for understanding exoplanets, in particular the early Earth? Yeah, so uh, Sanjoy definitely knows that I've I've spent some time thinking about early Earth. Maybe not as much as he does. He's definitely a, a good friend and colleague. Um, but uh, I so I, I I did a project in my master's where I looked at the role of of methane in keeping Earth warm. Uh, if you go backwards in time, uh, the sun. Is, is thought to have been less bright, that, and, and I won't get into the details of that. That has to do with just how stars work and 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 are powered by by nuclear fusion. So so um, a younger star is just not quite as bright. And how did our planet then stay warm? And so one of the ideas I explored was the role of methane and the formation of a haze layer, like you might see on the planet Titan, um, which uh, has both positive effects in helping keep the planet warm and protected by ultraviolet radiation and negative effects of of reflecting away sunlight and cooling the planet. And so, um, and the other feature of this, the reason you even get the haze is because this early earth was, was a very, very low oxygen environment. You had life, you may have had dissolved oxygen in some places in the ocean localized, but, but this would have been before large scale plant life or photosynthesis emerged. Uh, so early Earth, I think, would be more difficult to detect as, as, a, as a really strong biosignature, maybe. But I mean, I think this is, again, a problem in astrobiology that's really worth studying more. If we found a haze-covered planet around a, a, another star in the habitable zone, I would get really excited. It wouldn't mean there must be life, but that would be a great an analog for an early Earth. And we could try to think about what else would we look for to, to, to determine if life is there or not. Oh, uh, yeah. It's cool to think about, right? Like, I don't know, at what point do we actually become detectable anywhere? Um, another question, this comes in from Preetha Jaipal on SegaNet. Uh, Preetha asks, uh, inspired by the series The Expanse, uh, approximately how far away do you think we are from needing to make use of resources in our solar system uh, after we've depleted the resources for energy here on Earth? I think we are close to needing rare earth metals um, for all our smartphones and electronics. Um, most of them on earth are in China and that raises unique political uh, issues in accessing them. And even the ones that are there are still being depleted on earth. So I think um, there's, a, there's a lot of investors interested in asteroid mining. Now the main product they're interested in is water. And I believe the water stays in space. So it, it, it would be profitable to, to harvest water from asteroids to use for, for astronauts. And, and you, you, whether you drink the water, you make oxygen. Um, so that's the first product. But, but then you can get both precious metals and rare earth metals, rare earth minerals uh, from asteroids. I think that is going to become increasingly important in you know, the next century. I don't know in the next five to ten years, but in the next century, I think that'll be uh, that'll be coupled with our, our, our industries, space resources. That may be like the next big issue for our own sovereignty and our own governance, right? Is trying to figure out how do we actually bring more resources that we need. Uh, another question from Anarup, and I should mention Anarup is an astrologist on Twitter and Instagram, uh, and this is going to make you put on your your cosm- uh, cosmology hat for a moment. Uh, Anarup wants to know. Uh, we have a speed limit in the universe uh, with light. Uh, do we have any limit on how far we can look? Well, those things are related, in fact. So if we're looking at the Andromeda galaxy, 25 million light years away, we're seeing the galaxy as it was 25 million years ago, because that's how long it took that light to reach us. 
So the farther astronomy is actually one of the only real ways to do time travel, even more so than archaeology in a sense, or, or maybe they're very comparable in this sense, that with, with astronomy, the further away you look, the further back in time you're looking. So the furthest back you can look is just after the Big Bang, because before that there was, and it's, it's, there, there, you can get into the cosmology details about exactly when there was luminosity to, to be observed, but, but you can't, the, 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 yeah, for, f- that's how far you can observe because that's how old the universe is. Oh yeah, it's cool. I mean, and every, everyone, you know, you go out at night and you look at the stars, you're looking back in time. So astronomy is this time machine. Um, so it's kind of fun to think about, you know, that we, we are limited, but we also are looking back uh, so far in time. Uh, here's a question that's kind of off topic, but kind of fun to think about. Uh, it comes from Tom Caruso on Facebook. Uh, Tom states, recent discoveries, they show that, you know, we have icy you know bodies, these icy ocean worlds uh, all over in our solar system alone, and they're most likely... You know, abundant elsewhere, and on Earth, we humans have put a lot of noise into our oceans. Uh, and I would also add that also a lot of other things have put noise into our oceans. Uh, and so, Tom wants to know if we should start a program of trying to listen through the ice on some of these ice, icy worlds uh, for sounds below, perhaps by technological activity of a subsurface being. I mean, we really don't know what's out there. So, um, you know, one of the things that came from the workshop, or at least was introduced to the workshop by uh, Sophia Sheik, who is a PhD student at Penn State. Uh, she's developed the techno signature axes of merit. And this is, you know, we can imagine so many different techno signatures, and we really can't say that they must be false until we do a really thorough search and we put some limits on, on what might be there. So you, you should be able to brainstorm as many types, but then how do you actually decide what's worth looking for? And so she's got this nine axis framework that takes into account just, you know, how, how expensive is the search? Does it have ancillary benefits to science versus not? Um, you know, what would the impact be? There's, there's some other criteria. And so, um, you know, I, th- I think, I think all of these ideas are worth talking about, but then, you know, what do you actually do, especially since resources and funding is limited? Um, that's where, you know, the, the development of theory comes into play is, you know, would you expect, what type of signal would you expect under the ice and why? Um, if you were exploring for other reasons and you found some anomalies, that would also be interesting. But if you were going to do an intended search, that would probably need to be a more hypothesis driven approach. Mm, interesting. Yeah. It makes me think a lot, you know, with the idea of sound in our ocean from our technology and submarines and things like that, we also have a lot of sound in our oceans from shrimp and fish and whales and other things. That makes me wonder, uh, has there been much discussion about potential false positives in technosignature research? Uh, are, is there a good chance there are signs out there that would appear to us at first flush as being technological, but maybe they aren't? Absolutely. Yes. Techno, false positives for, for techno signatures are just like with biosignatures. We don't fully know what we're looking for. We can come up with some, some hypotheses, but you have to take into account the possibility that what you see it may not fully be explained by the, the biological or technological mechanism you're, you're looking at. Um, so you showed the, the photograph of Italy at night in the introduction or for the yesterday on Twitter. And so there's, there's also evidence uh, over Australia from those same sets of photos of wildfires. And, you know, I found this really interesting. I didn't realize that, that the fires had been that bad in Australia at that time, that, that they were that detectable from space. So if we were to see something, you know, build the right kind of optical stel- telescope image, some of these nearby planets, hypothetically, and, and you were to see bright lights like that, that would be a discussion then. If, let's say it was unambiguously this lights at night. Well, are those lo- sustained fires or are they city lights? And and there are ways that you could to, could determine between those two things. But if that one image was all you had, that would be a discussion. Um, now, one of the, uh, the, the workshop presenters, Thomas Beattie, he has this great idea showing that sodium lights have 
are really uh, easy to pick out with, with the right astronomy tools. With the spectrometer, you get a very clear signature that this is a sodium light. Those are those bright orange lights you see in, in cities and places. So, um, we, you know, would aliens use sodium lights? We don't know. But at least if, let's say we found this, this you know, Proxima at night picture. Um, well, you could do things like that. We don't know if these are fires or not, but let's do follow-up observations and see does this have the signature of a fire that we would expect through a telescope or the signature of a, of a light bulb or something else. And, and so it, it would take a while. If we detect something like this, there would be a period of prolonged discussion among scientists. And you know that would be great because that's how science works. But, but unfortunately, it means that the, the confirmation of a biosignature or technosignature will be a slower process probably than, than we would like it to be. Um, yeah, that, that first brings to mind, you know, in, in the past on Earth, we've had geological deposits that most likely were creating heat, potentially creating light. Uh, there was a natural deposit uh, rich in uranium in, in Africa, for instance, that underwent nuclear fission and, and started becoming its own geological nuclear reactor. Could alien worlds have nuclear reactors going on the surface that we would recognize and think maybe that's technological? It's, and so that brings a lot of questions to mind for what's possible out there. As you mentioned earlier, there's, there's so much that we can think about that could be possible. Uh, here's another question. This one's from Satyam Tiwari asking on SegaNet. And Satyam wants to know uh, how we can use machine learning uh, and artificial intelligence to help us in detecting extraterrestrial life uh, and add on also technosignatures. Well, that's a great question. And I promise I didn't plant that question because Satyam works for me and he also attended TechnoClimb. So he knows that there was an awful lot of discussion at our workshop about machine learning. Um, one idea, uh, Daniel Angerhausen, who's a blue marble space scientist, uh, he has is developing tools to look at the moon and then uh, possibly other surfaces. But but the moon uh, has been uh, the the lunar reconnaissance reconnaissance orbiter has mapped the surface of the moon to to a pretty high resolution. And so one thing you could think about is this idea of artifacts. Are have extraterrestrials sent? spacecraft to explore, you know, our solar system, could there be some unknown artifact on the moon, for example, or elsewhere, but starting with the moon? One thing you could do is go through these pictures one by one and look through them and see if you can figure out, see if there's anything weird on them. But th there's too many pictures to really be, me you could do this in a crowdfunded way, perhaps. But what Daniel's doing is developing machine learning algorithms to sort through these images and, and do not not a not a trained machine learning where you you tell it what an artifact is, but truly in an unsupervised machine learning algorithm where it's just taking all the data in and just trying to tell you what anomalies are there. And so I think I believe he's working on it right now. I think he's validated the algorithm so it'll pick out some of the, the artifacts humans have sent there, perhaps. Um, so you know that's one idea you could think about doing this for. Um, for, for for other types of problems, maybe if you're analyzing, like uh, um, you're trying to think about, about a large number of, of, of types of planetary atmospheres, you might be able to use machine learning in a way to help uh, to help explore a really large sample space that'd be really difficult to do uh, by yourself. So, um, you know, this is this is an interesting I, I guess one other way to do that, that that's being done now is this the, the radio technosignatures, which is searching for either direct transmissions from other star systems, uh, other civilizations, or sort of their radio leakage, their, their transmission towers and things like we're using, where we're just putting radio waves into space because of our communication and, and, and other activities. Um, so th there's, there's astronomers, the Breakthrough Listen team in particular is taking huge amounts of data um, by, by pointing radio telescopes at you know, hundreds and thousands of stars. And so sorting through that data to identify what might be a possible techno signature, a message or, you know, some, something that indicates it was intentionally transmitted. Um, that's something you could do, use machine learning for to, to take the, the, to automate the process of sorting through that and looking for any patterns or anomalies that might stick out. Yeah. And there's, and there's so much data in that realm too. Uh, we're not even all, listening to all of the sky and all the bandwidths all the time. If we started doing that, it'd be so much data. So having machine learning, having, having, having this to help us process those data would be huge. I would imagine. 
Yeah, there's really a data problem too in many fields in science where the collection of data is outpacing the analysis. And so that's where these machine learning tools can be really useful is if, if you understand the data set and you're really clever about how to use your machine learning, you might be able to go to a data set, whether it's in astronomy or some other field and learn something new based on measurements someone else has already taken. And that's very cool how that happens in the sciences too. Uh, and this kind of leads into our next question from uh, Jamie Stankovich on Facebook. Uh, Jamie wants to know, uh, besides machine learning here, what instruments, what technologies uh, do you think we really need or are going to need to find life beyond the earth? Well, I promise that's not a setup question either, because that is a great question. Um, NASA invests in these giant space telescopes, and they're never big enough for what we want to do now. Um, so the theory always is kind of ahead of what we can really observe. The James Webb Telescope is the next big one that's set to launch. Um, I believe later this year. I don't know how the pandemic is affecting that. Um, but the James Webb Telescope would be a huge advancement over what, what's been flown before. As far as biosignatures and technosignatures go, I think it will not be able to take a large, large number of observations of many, many Earth-sized planets. I think the discussions I have seen suggest that it might be, you know, one or two. So the, the TRAPPIST-1 system, which is a, a planetary system uh, with, with, you know, s several rocky planets orbiting a red dwarf star, one of which is seemed to be within the habitable zone. We might be able to really understand that system with James Webb Telescope, maybe one or two others, maybe. Um, now, maybe we get lucky and there's life on that planet and we find, you know, some biosignatures that are within what, what James Webb can detect. Um, maybe there's technosignatures. signatures. I can't say there's not. I can't say that there will be. But but at least, you know, if we saw something weird with James Webb, that would be really interesting and worth following up on. But there's a series of missions that are being planned now uh, in design phase. There's uh, Louvoir, the, um, which is, is a, a large optical ultraviolet infrared telescope. So it spans a wide range of wavelengths. That's the biggest beast sort of, and that would get about 60 observations of, of Earth-like planets. Um, the HabX is a smaller version of that in, in a way um, that could get about, I think, 30 to 40. So, so those would be really interesting. And there's the Origin Space Telescope, which uh, that one actually goes out does more infrared observations, which potentially could be interesting for technosignatures. Things like chlorofluorocarbons I was talking about would probably have more of more evidence at those infrared uh, areas uh, in the wave in the in the spectrum. Um, so, and then, and then there's the Life mission, which is is a, a European mission, and that's similar in some ways that that it has capabilities for this infrared observation that might be really interesting for technosignatures. So those are the interesting missions. They're all in design phase. They're not all going to get selected to be built, but hopefully one of them will. And and that would be cool because you would not be able to just study one or two, but but a, a population of Earth-sized planets to really say how common is a biosignature. Maybe how common is a techno signature? Yeah, and it makes me wonder sometimes, like what the future is for astronomy and looking at exoplanets and what science lies ahead of some of these great telescopes we're planning or we haven't even thought of yet that are coming down the line. Uh, Jacob, we are running low on time. I have one more question I want to get to, uh, and this one comes from Ariana Patterson on SeganNet. Uh, we were speaking earlier about running out of resources here on the Earth and going out and harvesting, for instance, heavy metals from asteroids uh, for us to have here. Uh, Ariana asked an intriguing question um, about how we balance our commercial interests in exploiting you know, other worlds with our scientific interests. Uh, so what do you see as the risks in terms of planetary protection and ethics versus the benefits to our advancement? Yeah, that's a great question. And I'm certainly not going to be able to address all of that. But that's an important tension that's emerged. So space was really the domain of science up until very recently, and this commercial interests are a new phenomenon. So there are going to be some uh, some tensions between those interests. Uh, one idea, Charles Cackell uh, in, in, in the UK has suggested the idea of planetary parks. Maybe like on Earth, we have you know various national and state parks. 
Uh, you might have planetary parks that are reserved for science or maybe even places that scientists don't go very often to really preserve the Martian environment. But we are going to have to have these conversations and there will be trade-offs uh, and it won't always be clear as to which way to tip that balance. That's cool. Planetary parks makes me think that what happens if we are a park, <laughs> like the planetary zoo hypothesis, this idea that aliens from outside are are keeping us closed off and just watching what we do. <laughs> are we a science experiment? Um, it's kind of cool to think about. Uh, well, Jacob, it's been such a pleasure having you on the show. Uh, thanks so much for joining us. I know we couldn't get to all the questions, everyone out there. Uh, please feel free to reach out to Jacob. Uh, uh, Jacob, how can they reach you online? You know, if you just want to send me a message on Twitter, then I'll take a look at it and I'll reply to your question. That's wonderful. He's at, at Hawk Misra on Twitter. You guys can reach him there. Uh, also a member of the Blue Marble Space Institute of Science. Uh, Jacob, it's been so great having you on the show. Thank you for joining us. Thanks again, Graham. It's been fun. Awesome. And for those viewing at home, we have a fun question for you. Uh, you can reach out to me at Cosmobiologist. Uh, you can reach us at, at Saganorg on Twitter, uh, as well as at NASA Astrobio on Twitter. Uh, our question for you is, uh, what signs of technological civilizations do you think we are most likely to find and might drive us to figuring out that there are other technological civilizations out there? Uh, so if you have an idea about that, feel free to reach out and hit us up. Uh, thank you, as always, for joining Ask an Astrobiologist. And as always, stay curious. Stay curious.